The Heal Report is pleased to welcome Art Levine, journalist and author of the soon-to-be-released book, Mental Health, Inc., How Corruption, Lacks Oversight, and Failed Reforms Endanger Our Most Vulnerable Citizens. Welcome, Art. Well, thank you very much for having me on The Heal Report um, show. Well, we're happy to have you. Mental Health, Inc. is a great read, and I appreciate you sending me an advanced copy so I could take a look. Uh, it has a lot of valuable information. How long did it take you to write? Well, basically, I, it took, I, the contract was for three years, but I began researching these issues back in 2001 uh, when I uh, began to look at the criminalization of people with mental illness uh, because there was a number of killings of people with mental illness by police and the conditions for people with mental illness were, were just horrific, and there were some tragedies where people without any treatment at all had killed uh, a few family members, although most violence is perpetrated against people with serious mental illness, not by the mentally ill. Right. And, and so, the, so then basically uh, I had a contract starting in 2013, but I had done some of the research in areas including on – what some people used to call the troubled teen industry and now is referred to the congregant care industry. I looked at it in terms of youth congregant care in 2012, uh, looked at Bain Capital and its uh, very um, allegedly horrific Aspen education programs that I investigated as well as some of their problematic drug treatment programs. Right, you've been doing this for years and we've loved your work um, all along, of course, we have posted a lot of your articles on our website as well. What do you find most compelling about your work? Were you surprised by the level of corruption you uncovered? Yeah, I, w I actually was surprised about this issue of corruption, which is, like most people, when I, I – the area that I focus a lot on – there is a lot of corruption. The area that's best documented is the pharmaceutical industry's um, egregious – marketing for off-label, which means completely unapproved for use by the FDA, and there's no medical justification whatsoever, but doctors are permitted to prescribe, but uh, drug companies are not permitted to market for those off-label purposes. So I, when I look deeply at the off-label use of antipsychotics on young people, on senior citizens and veterans, what I, I, I knew about the corruption, I just didn't know how long it had been going on, and most critically, how much the federal government plays a role in directly abetting corruption. The reason is, many of us see these headlines that go, like AstraZeneca in 2012 uh, settled $510 million fine for off-label prescribing of uh, Seroquel and illegal marketing to different uh, populations. Or uh, the best known perhaps is uh, over $2 billion by uh, Johnson & Johnson for Risperdal, which included damages that are still being, with tens of thousands of lawsuits, giving uh, teenage boys 46 DD breasts, okay? All of these things, I knew somewhat about the corruption. What was surprising to me that I learned, particularly when I looked at over-medication for youth and in senior citizen homes, was the degree to which the federal government's Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services refused to stop paying for fraudulent uses of the drugs, deliberately turned the other way, and have had their agenda corrupted by the drug industry. Furthermore, the HHS, the Health and Human Services, of which CMS is a part, they never enforce any corporate integrity agreements. So literally out of the last 25 years and dozens and dozens of, of violations by drug companies of marketing, only two companies have got slightly tiny fines over like a 25-year period. And and that and, and basically there's no meaningful enforcement. And so what it means is that the corruption is so built in that it is part of doing business for it is basically like if a mafia organization in the 1970s paying off some police captains to look the other way. So they don't necessarily directly bribe uh, government officials, but 
government officials are sort of schooled to look the other way and therefore they can keep repeating the wrongdoing over and over and over again without any consequences. But the consequ that's for the corporation, no consequences. So if a company like uh, AstraZeneca made $5 billion in just one year, in one of their top years, they get to make $5 billion for 17 years until their patent expires. So when they... So when eventually, decades into their work, uh, the federal government learns about the illegal marketing that's being alleged by whistleblowers and finally takes action, and they pay $500 million, who cares? It is chump change. So the, the public citizen had a good report on this. So over a 25-year period, drug industries paid more fines than any other business in terms of um, you know, fines for fraud than defense contractors, anything you ever heard of, drug industry far and away the worst. They paid out $35 billion in fines. Well, that seems like a lot of money, but if it's like over 300 incidents of fraud over 25 years and during that same period, their net revenue was $711, $711 billion, who cares? It means absolutely nothing. So the the consequences are that nothing really happens. What was the most disturbing information you found in your research? Well, the most disturbing information beside the broad pattern of corruption and indifference that leads to deaths of young people and the elderly and veterans is what I found through a lead from you, which was Restoration Youth Academy and the degree of savage brutality that was completely untrammeled in this Alabama school that was essentially a Christian fundamentalist school for torturing kids, where kids were hung upside down and beaten with whips and shackled and put in isolation chambers for months at a time in, in ways that are a violation of the Geneva Code for torturing prisoners. It's, and that nobody, except for Captain Charles Kennedy, who you referred me to, nobody in any level of government in the state of Alabama or even in federal um, levels when he tried to touch base with the FBI was willing to do anything for five or so years. And these kids kept getting beaten, beaten. The, it's very fortunate that nobody died, but people could easily have died. And eventually... Um, they they were found out by another police department and and with your support and the support of local activists they passed what appears to be the strongest law in the country uh, to regulate these um, sort of unlicensed programs and unregistered programs uh, that are you know dealing with troubled uh, troubled youth as they're sometimes called and that the level of brutality that was monstrous, that was permitted and, and, and winked at, despite having a, a police, a very credible police captain with a Pritchard Police Department, Captain Charles Kennedy, take a, uh, you know, try to get some action and get them arrested, is, is really is the most shocking thing I found. Definitely, and we're very happy to have Charles Kennedy as part of the HEAL team. He's our Alabama coordinator now, so we're very excited that he decided to join us in this fight to stop this abuse. Can we expect a sequel or a second edition? Well, um, I, I, hope to follow, I hope to follow it up. Um, uh, I, I, hope, I hope to follow it up and... Um, I, I hope to follow the um, it up with additional work in this line. I don't think there'll be a second edition, but if there's a paperback edition, which hasn't yet, I might update it with additional new information, uh, some of which you've gathered about the full scope of deaths and best ways to approach trauma for people who've been through these institutional um, institutional facilities. And, and the difficulty in trying to find help in a way without forcing young people to go into treatment, given they've already been brutalized by treatment. But the next arena of research that I'm eager to look forward to, and again, this is someone you referred me to and I learned about, was the role of family courts in 
which has a tie to residential treatment uh, abuses, is these family courts that often turn over uh, kids who to people who have, uh, you know, often well-to-do and powerful fathers in custody disputes who have very credible allegations of physical abuse or domestic abuse. And over, uh, you know, perhaps like a six-year period, uh, hundreds of kids have been killed uh, as a result, and this is not being paid much attention to. And, and this broader scandal to me is akin to what it was like in terms of the church pedophile scandal in the 1980s and 1990s before it broke big in the Boston Globe in the early 2000s. So it hasn't yet gotten the full attention it deserves, and it ties into the abuses uh, in the mental health system and residential treatment fields that I have in this first book. Definitely. Oh, yeah, and a lot of people uh, use these facilities um, just to hide away kids that have no problems because they're abuse victims who might testify against them or similar situations. So that is definitely worth looking into. So when will mental health ink be available and can we expect it in paperback? I know you mentioned you were thinking about getting it out there in paperback. Well, um, I, we don't have a paperback deal yet. You, that depends on hardcover sales and uh, we're, we're uh, and Kindle sales. So it's going to be available for Kindle. And one thing, um, it'll be available for sale August 15th. You can uh, purchase it in pre-sale with discounts at Amazon right now. Uh, one of the advantages of Kindle is the Kindle version will have, uh, I have 60 pages of endnotes with hundreds of references, and wherever there's a URL that's online, I link I linked to that live. So you can, and one of the advantages, is, so for instance, if the, a doctor had been uh, investigated for possible criminal misconduct and the over-medication of a kid and the, the doctor was deposed, I have the deposition. Uh, in other words, so many original documents, uh, long original lawsuits that outra- outline chapter and verse wrongdoing by a drug company, it will be there online as well as articles, medical studies, and uh, evasive responses by government agencies about their failures to support effective programs and their willingness to allow harmful practices to continue. Right. That sounds great. I, I know that a lot of people should get the electronic version if they do have an electronic reader so that they do have access to those links. Will your website, Mental Health Inc., um, or the uh, Scribid page have these links as well, or yeah. do they have to go no, to no, the they, elect- they'll, they'll be at the uh, full end note, should be online at mentalhealthinc.net, but at this point, um, that that website's under construction, so um, there's it, basically the uh, mental health incorporated at scribid.com. If you if you look, uh, you know, I could read. I will be transferring that. Uh, I'll be transferring the uh, the website name, so you can go right now to scribid.com. But the actual full the actual full uh, name is has Mental Health Incorporated and Scribid in it. And that is, that. so the public profile, it's, it, the public profile is a little long-winded to read. So basically if you, it's, it's, I'll tell you what it is, but you're better off just Googling with hyphens in between Art Levine, Mental Health Inc., and scribid.com and Google, and it should bring it up. But I'm also going to, but the website eventually will be called mentalhealthinc.net, and that is that is going to be up and running uh, uh, quite soon. It isn't yet built yet. So in the interim, mentalhealthinc.net will forward to my Scribid page. Um, but also you can go directly to the Scribid page by just searching Google scribid.com and art-levine-mental-health-inc. That's a little long-winded and more long-winded, of course, than mentalhealthinc.net, but I'll get that forwarded uh, to uh, first my Scribid and then my uh, new web page, which will have a lot of additional links and updated blogs about news developments 
including what is happening to sabotage uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare and Medicaid uh, right now, even with the failure of the repeal efforts by Republicans. So millions of people um, are still in danger because of Trump's sort of egomaniac willingness to destroy Obamacare to prove himself right and force Democrats to bargain with him. Um, and it's my view that either through the legislative repeal, which has temporarily failed, or back end, that uh, thousands of people could very well end up dying in ways that they wouldn't have beforehand. And particularly for uh, people with opiate addictions, perhaps as many as like 1.5 million people with various addictions uh, were were added uh, as part of uh, the extension of Medicaid and Obamacare. Um, those people are in serious danger if, if, the, if this system is undercut, either through withdrawing subsidies to the Obamacare program, individual markets, or giving right-wing states these big waivers where they can just stop covering essential benefits. And, and I, in my book, give an example of that about Tennessee. In Tennessee, 350,000 people were dropped from the state Medicaid program known as TennCare. And as a result, 30,000 people with serious mental illness and addictions lost their coverage and suicide skyrocketed, jailing skyrocketed, rehospitalization skyrocketed, and some families in their obituaries for their suicidal uh, adult, uh, young adult uh, uh, son uh, would, sons and daughters would mention the role of the 10 care cuts in helping drive their kids into suicide. All of that could happen. Well, that's arguable though, because I would say the treatment they were receiving may have been abusive and may have been what actually caused their suicides. Oh and yeah, not, yeah, no, no, but but that I, I was just I, I was no, care. no, absolutely. I was talking about you know standard issue. If they yes, if they were in a residential treatment facility, yes, that could have definitely accelerated suicidal impulse. I'm just talking about standard outpatient care which is usually not very effective, which is another focus of my book, poor quality care. And no, right, I right. agree with you. But one of the factors, and this is where the dangers of antipsychotics are very much underplayed. You may hear mental health, conventional mental health reform advocates tell you that people with serious mental illness die on average 25 years uh, earlier than the average person. And everyone goes, well, that's just horrible. Well, of course it's all, but one of the points that they never say is that 25-year death rate, which is a, a younger death rate, uh, nearly as bad as death rates and, and you, uh, young deaths in sub-Saharan Africa, those are people enrolled in the Medicaid program. Met, seriously mentally ill people enrolled in Medicaid, supposedly getting services, they die 25 years earlier than the average American. And antipsychotics improperly given play a role in that because they can, if misused, overused, and not properly monitored, cause sudden cardiac death and or extreme weight gain and diabetes. So the issue, and I'm not anti the use of antipsychotics for people with schizophrenia if it's done in a judicious manner with personalized therapy and broader social supports. And eventually, uh, recent research indicates that you don't need to, if you, even if you have schizophrenia, you don't necessarily need to take it lifelong, you know, in, in cooperation with an intelligent doctor and compassionate doctor. And that, I profile that kind of person, but that is not common treatment. Right. Uh, Unfortunately, and certainly not for the poor who are usually the ones on Medicaid who are usually being targeted for abusive right. and experimental treatments and being used at guinea pigs to find absolutely treatments for the rich. So yeah, yeah I'm I, not so sure I'm upset about the Medicaid cuts since I think Medicaid is um, not providing the quality of care and the oversight for the use of public funds to make sure that people are getting effective and compassionate care. I, I, so, I, I don't know. I, 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 don't think, know it's, I think it's a 
you know, it's a half full, half empty thing in this regard. I think you're absolutely correct about how bad the care is and how dangerous the care is. But it's my view that that people have a shot at getting better care um, and are, you know, more likely to at least be able to survive if they get access to medical and mental health care, but not necessarily. And that's one of the tragedies. So, for instance, a good portion of my book looks at over-medication, needless, irresponsible over-medication of people with uh, PTSD who are veterans who shouldn't be getting antipsychotics at all. And often um, they're mixed in with opiates and tranquilizers, and there's been thousands of deaths uh, due to accidental overdoses, not suicides, but accidental overdoses, and that is improperly being uh, addressed. However, when it comes to suicides, which, you know, could be at minimum 20 a day, and some research I'm running across for a forthcoming Newsweek piece indicates that the actual suicide dates, when you actually look at all local records, all death records of all veterans, you will find it could be twice as high. So it's a real problem. And uh, however, there's a higher suicide rate for those who don't get any VA services at all compared to those who get VA services. But it shouldn't be happening at this essentially epidemic level. And then, right. and, and then in the Newsweek piece, I'm also looking at the role of the drug company corrupting the VA in terms of promoting overuse of um, both opiates and antipsychotics in ways that have le left thousands of people dead. It's, right. it's really a national tragedy that hasn't been seriously addressed yet. Those are all good points. <laughs> yes, the veterans, the VA stuff uh, was very upsetting when I was reading through the book. I mean, everything else, it was a very, it was eye-opening to me because I, I, didn't realize it was going to be that bad. And I have a lot of family that receive VA services or that are retired military, so I'm aware of some of it, but um, not to the extent or the, la or the corruption involved or the lack of care. I'd be curious if the number of suicides uh, that are reduced by um, receiving care are counterbalanced by deaths from that care or from the mistreatment or over medication of that care. I uh, well you know, that, that, that would be worth that same. would be worth studying. I yeah. do know that some of the there's only been spotty research about over medication in the VA and, and it's very out of date and some data indicates um, that it's possible well it's it's hard to decipher when the um, when the uh, Austin American statesmen look very closely just in their area, they found that of those people who were receiving VA benefits, which could be disability, doesn't mean they necessarily went to the VA for care, those people who got VA benefits, there were more deaths due to accidental overdoses than to suicides. Wow. And, and, so and maybe even more people are dying as that's a result right. of receiving care than right, are dying from right. suicide and, from not receiving right. care. Right. The whole area is poorly defined. There is some valuable bipartisan legislation been introduced uh, by Senator McCain and by some Democrats that ask for a National Academy of Sciences study. It's actually called the Veterans Over Medication Prevention Act. It's a very important piece of legislation that it is just started to be introduced, um, hasn't been brought to the floor, had hearings, but its its potential is quite important, at least to raise awareness and create, it's demanding a National Academy of Sciences study of every single accidental death at all related to medication and suicide. Okay, and that and that we, they need to know exactly all medications and go well beyond whatever data the VA has to really look at county coroner's offices, any you know uh, pre prescription drug monitoring programs that are state civilian based, looking at a whole range, trying to really get a handle on it because the VA doesn't bother to. Um, right. 
And then I found something that is really pretty remarkable um, that I didn't even know about. That is a study that I'm going to be referencing in Newsweek. But apparently, um, one veteran researchers at one veteran location looked at the rate of suicide of people who were getting five or more central nervous system drugs. Okay, and they corrected for mental illness and depression. They found that you could, the risk of someone committing suicide, acting in a suicidal behavior, or overdosing, you know, whether fatal or non-fatal, but the risk to either suicide, suicidal behavior, overdosing, was 400% higher for those who were getting multiple medications, and multiple medications of central nervous system medications, which can include antipsychotics, opiates, tranquilizers, mood stabilizers, all sorts of stuff. Any of those types of medications, psychiatric and or opiates, given, given five or more, which is common practice in the VA and across American medicine, was 400 times higher level of suicide risk or suicide. Now that is shocking and is an indication of just how important it is to get a handle on this over medication. And one right. of my points is no powerful advocacy group in the country, none, powerful and influential, access to media can sway Congress, and no government agency, none, is seriously addressing this issue. It's complete. Because they're all in the pot back getting money from the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> Absolutely. You found that with some of the big names like NAMI, right? They right, NAMI and Mental money. Health America. Yes, they're all, yeah. they're, you know, it varies. NAMI is actually getting less portion now than Mental Health America, which is up to close to 40%. But, yes, and the... And it, and then there's the revolving door. So one of the so there's a revolving door. So people who work for the federal government, if they get if they look the other way or they give these rubber stamp bogus five star ratings to like nursing homes, they then can leave the government and go work for the industry. Or one of right. the, one of the top people who was sort of head of the psychiatric drug research branch for the FDA, he basically always managed to, you know, push push the envelope uh, for promoting off-label uses and, and, you know, lobby the advisory groups to approve off, you know, previously off-label uses of antipsychotics for kids and, and depression and so on. You know, as soon as he left the FDA, what does he do? He becomes a consultant to the drug industry, you know, helping enrich them by billions. So well, no problem giving him consultant grants afterwards and it's you know protected he wasn't you know he there was enough of a gap in time that whatever was revolving door legislation limiting that kind of work didn't apply and now he's free working for the drug industries advising them and so this kind of um of of corruption and you know and you know using the there's a di dictum credit to mike kinsley uh the words to the effect that the real scandal in Washington is not what's illegal, but what is legal. Right. And, and much, <laughs> much of what this is, is all permitted. It's just business as usual and business as usual causes the death of thousands of people. So for instance, over medication in nursing homes, uh, giving even to people with dementia, antipsychotics to quiet them down, according to the best FDA estimates, kills needlessly 15,000 senior citizens a year who otherwise would have survived. That is five 9-11s a year in drug deaths in nursing homes, and nobody's doing anything meaningful to stop it. Right. So, and I'm, and I'm very glad that your organization does such very important work. I credit, I credit uh, you in the acknowledgments of the book, and I reference your research in various places in the book and quote you and other influential leaders in the uh, congregant care reform uh, field. And I think that's a, that's a, that is another area where 
massive abuse goes on, and there is essentially no regulation, with the exception of this Alabama law, and we don't know how it will be implemented, but at least it has some teeth in it, and that that's in, in part due to the work that you've done in Alabama. Right, and, and Captain Kennedy. Right, yeah. right. He'll, yeah. He's, he's been excellent fighting for this. Um, is there anything else you would like to add? Well, no, I, th- I just think that for people who are survivors of institutional abuse and congregant care abuse, I think it would be valuable. Now, this is self-interested, but if this book did well and if people blogged about it or wrote about it or sent emails about it to their friends and allies and there was a kind of groundswell of interest, this book will help forward the agenda of those who are trying to crack down on these completely irresponsible usages of antipsychotics and of the unregulated, violent, and abusive congregant care and institutional care settings. Yes, I agree. Your book is awesome, and it's going to be an invaluable tool for those of us who are working to stop this abuse. Thank you for being a guest of The Heal Report. Having read the manuscript, I believe Mental Health Inc. is a great introduction to the problems in the mental health industry and encourage viewers to also read my review of Mental Health Inc., now available on our blog. You can also learn more about this book by visiting mentalhealthinc.net, and I will provide additional links, um, the Scribd link and everything else, in the description on the video. Thanks, and also it's available for purchase and pre-purchase at Amazon. So thanks again for host, hosting me and, and showing your interest in the book and for the important activism that you do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.